and advancing. I think, yeah, okay. that works. Left and right. All right. Thanks, All right. Don. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Don Siegel. So I'm going to tell you today about uh, research in my group where we use computation to try and understand and discover new materials for energy storage. And so I'm going to wager that as of, well, before we had these things, probably none of you even gave a second thought to energy storage. But so at least cell phones have gotten us to think about a new technology, which in principle is you know, the center of a, a universe of, of interesting and helpful applications. So I'm sure some of you are familiar with the role of energy storage and transportation. So the drive to electrify vehicles is something which is ongoing. And it's a big challenge because, well, gasoline, for all of its flaws, is a really dense way to store energy. Um, a typical gasoline car can drive 400 miles before we need to refill it, and we can recharge it in three minutes. Um, that's a challenge for any of these other technologies you see next to it. So I drive an electric vehicle. We're storing electrons in that vehicle, but to charge it takes hours, and I can go maybe 200 miles on a full charge. Other uh, uh, future fuels, things like hydrogen, uh, could be produced renewably and consumed without CO2 uh, emissions. But hydrogen is a gas at standard temperatures and pressures. So by definition, it's not very dense. So how do we get enough hydrogen on board so that people would want to invest in that technology. So beyond transportation, energy storage is useful for the grid. So uh, imagine a big battery we place on the grid that can absorb extra electricity, which is generated, say, by the wind at night when the demand is low. We can then use that energy the next day, maybe when production is down and demand is up. And then there's other applications, so things that might be helpful for human welfare. For example, robotics. And the university is investing lots of money in a robotics institute. Uh, we're trying to get these robots to walk very elegantly, but if they have a runtime that lasts in, say, units of minutes, then we still have some more work to do. That comes back to energy storage. So as I mentioned, my group was a computational group, um, and we try to use computation in two ways to, to make better energy storage materials. Uh, the first one is one which has been used, say, for decades. We just try to understand how these materials work. And we try to understand at the level of electrons and atoms. So atomistic simulation is what we do in my group. On certain occasions, and we can't do this in all instances, but we try to use computation to predict what would be a better material. So what's an optimal material to put in a battery? Or what's an efficient way to store hydrogen? And so I want to show you two examples from those two categories. The first one is using computation to go really fast and discover materials that might be dense ways to store hydrogen. So this is, again, this might be the future fuel tank on a fuel cell vehicle where we store hydrogen instead of gas. And so we are involved in a collaboration with Adam Matzger, who is in the chemistry department here, and Ford Motor Company in Dearborn. What we're trying to do are uh, find hydrogen sponges, things called metal organic frameworks that have lots of nooks and crannies for absorbing hydrogen molecules. And so what I'm plotting here is the energy density of about 100,000 of these MOFs, which we can predict in just seconds or minutes. This is the energy by volume, the energy by mass. And all of these points represent calculations we've done at the atomic scale on different metal organic frameworks. So a few years ago, we started out with this compound, MOF 5. And through our calculations, we've gone up and to the right here. I'm just going to talk about the black data, which is one way to operate such a storage device. But what we found is through our predictions and through our synthetic efforts in chemistry and our measurements at Ford Motor, we can go up and to the right. And so some of the materials we've discovered are shown here on the far right of the slide. And so this is a step in the right direction. There's still other challenges to getting these materials to operate at reasonable temperatures. So we're part of the way there, but not yet at a solution. Another way to uh, use computation is just trying to understand what's going on in some of these materials. So our next speaker is going to talk about batteries and solid state batteries. This is an example of a solid electrolyte, which is an amorphous material, a glassy material that conducts lithium at, the, at about the same rate as a liquid. And we'd like to understand how this device works so that we can come up with better uh, versions of it. And what I'm showing on the far right here is the way that lithium moves. So all of these different colors are lithium ions that begin and end in a different place as they migrate. So you can see that four of them are migrating at the same time. That's what we call cooperative motion. 
But on top of that, the anions, these PS43 uh, anions, rotate and track the lithium. That's a very unusual process called a paddle wheel effect. And we're pretty excited about having that mechanism, seeing it at room temperature. So I'm almost out of time, yes? Time up. So, as I, so to conclude, I want to acknowledge a, a center that supports this work, the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research. There are other members at the University of Michigan that are parts of this center. And in the end, I want to show you my vision for the future, which is stolen from The Economist from a couple summers ago. I'm hopeful that in our lifetime, we'll see the end of the internal combustion engine and due to advances in energy storage, make a complete transition to electrified transportation. Thanks for your attention.